in bringing to attention the plight of the Tamil victims of uh, Sri Lanka. I, before introducing my dear friend, uh, Dr. Gerard Francis, uh, let me just give you one brief um, um, uh, summary of my involvement with Sri Lanka. Uh, as some of you know, I uh, go around the world um, and uh, lecture and counsel people on human rights. Uh, some years ago, uh, I was doing um, a, uh, uh, a presentation in, uh, in uh, uh, India, uh, in Mumbai, India, where I met several Sri Lankan human rights people who invited me surreptitiously to go to Sri Lanka. Uh, I met uh, on them on a tourist visa, which was rather precarious for me to do. We met quietly. I gave them training in human rights. And uh, I'm not going to tell you some of the details because these people could be in, in, in danger by your knowing where or who they are. But uh, they were able to go into the detention camps and take testimony, uh, which ultimately uh, will be useful in what has presently happened. I have subsequently made uh, several other trips to Sri Lanka while the war was going on and after the war has finished. Uh, and in the, uh, next to the last trip uh, in Sri Lanka, um, I was able to visit the north. Uh, and there I saw internally displaced Tamils uh, in conditions that were unbelievable. The only similar uh, situation I have ever witnessed uh, were Albanians in Kosovo. Uh, the, what I had witnessed in Kosovo regarding ethnic cleansing uh, and uh, uh, instances of crimes against humanity uh, were repeated with the same intensity, if not greater, uh, in uh, northern Sri Lanka amongst the Tamil community uh, 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 from a very personal basis uh, discussing with IDPs, internally displaced people, their plight. Play. I swore uh, as a human rights lawyer that any opportunity I have uh, to assist the plight of the Tamil people, I would take. Subsequent to that visit, I have worked with the Tamil diaspora, uh, and I have been in uh, Geneva, along with Dr. Francis and many other Tamils, uh, attempting to persuade the United Nations to intervene uh, and to take appropriate uh, remedial action uh, for what you will see is a gross and systematic violation of human rights. Last December, one year uh, ago, nearly one year ago, a few days shy, um, before uh, my hoping to go back to Geneva to, additional, to make additional attempts to convince the Human Rights Council to condemn the Sri Lankan government, um, I was able to get a tourist visa uh, to go to Colombo, uh, and I, my hope was I was going to be Tamils, go to the north, and get a first-hand um, uh, view of what was happening. The Sri Lankan government, who had previously given me a uh, visa, greeted me uh, with uh, uh, a uh, order that I was now under arrest. Uh, I was kept under detention uh, and sent on uh, an airplane back uh, to Britain under police guard. Uh, I am now persona non grata uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I did return to the Human Rights Council and what you have before you is the outcome of uh, what we achieved last year at the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council passed a resolution calling for an international independent investigation of what is happening on Sri Lanka. Part of the reason that happened was because of this film. Callum McRae showed this film in side events before the vote was taken. This film influenced the world to finally pay attention to what is a gross and systematic violation of human rights of a minority people who have suffered for more than 25 years uh, since, uh, since time of memorial. And in that respect, I would very much like to introduce 
uh, my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Gerard Francis, who we've been together on many occasions on behalf of the uh, Connells. Um, and uh, uh, I can also add, if I am persona non grata um, in Sri Lanka, he came to Canada and now the United States uh, on political asylum uh, because uh, returning to Sri Lanka may very well mean his, if not his incarceration, his death. So I, with that, I welcome you to welcome Dr. Francis. Thank you, Professor Alden. Thank you, Professor Lou. Uh, can everybody hear me at the back? Um, so uh, this is something that's very dear to me. This is uh, something that I have a vested interest in because this portrays the sufferings of my people. But before we get into some background, uh, before I set this movie in context, I just wanted to tell you uh, how I am presenting myself here. So earlier on we had a discussion uh, we were talking about identity earlier on, and all of us have different identities. We are fathers, brothers, uh, uh, spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, sometimes uh, professions define us. So I'm coming to you today as an American. Uh, I'm coming to you today also as a Canadian. I have dual citizenship. I do not have any citizenship in Sri Lanka anymore. I come to you as a medical doctor. I'm also coming to you here as a psychiatrist uh, and also as an activist trying to let the world know what kind of suffering my people have gone through. So today we are here on a fall day in uh, December, uh, very different from December's in Sri Lanka where the average temperature is like 90 degrees or more sometimes. How many of you know where Sri Lanka is? So I see quite a few people know where it is. It's on the southern tip of uh, India. Uh, so it's a little island, a teardrop shaped island. And this island has gone through a lot of turmoil in the past uh, maybe 60, 70 years. Even before that there was some turmoil, but not as much as in the past uh, 50, 60 years. And this movie, this specific movie is about the end of a war, a war. Uh, end of a war where the government of Sri Lanka was fighting not just uh, the liberation tigers of Tamil Nadu who were the uh, rebels fighting against the government on behalf of the Tamils, but it was also systematically killing off the Tamils in the, on the island. The government claimed that all these people were citizens of its own country, but it was systematically killing off its own people. The estimates vary from 40,000 to 140,000 people being killed within a span of about three months. So it's a modern day genocide within a span of three months, 40 to 120,000 people were killed. And the numbers are so difficult to ascertain because it was a war without witnesses. You will see in this movie, and while I put this in context, you will hear that the government of Sri Lanka got everybody who could witness this out of this area. They got the United Nations to stand down and to stand by while they conducted this war without witnesses. They pulled out the United Nations staff. They pulled out foreign journalists. Everybody was taken out of this war zone. People were herded into an area called a no-fire zone. So they were told that this is going to be safe to go in here and they were systematically killed within that with heavy weapons aerial bombardment, um, shelling, and you will see that in the movie. But why did this conflict start and how did this come to this ruse of end and there are some human rights violations that are on the way that um, we can talk about later on in the question and answer session that uh, all three of us will be part of if you have questions at the end. So first we want to know about this island. So it's a small island, it's about 25,000 square miles. So if you think of New Jersey, it's about uh, two and a half to three times the size of New Jersey. That's all it is. It's a small island with about 22 to 23 million people. So a lot of people on a small island. Two major ethnic groups. So there are the Tamils in the north and east of the island. I'm a Tamil, I'm an ethnic Tamil. Tamils speak the Tamil language. 
The majority of the Tamils are Hindus, and then you have the south and the central regions. The people are called Sinhalese. They speak the language Sinhalese, and their religion is mostly Buddhist. There, there are Christians also because of the colonization that happened. So there are two, over <coughs> like from 500 BC, you can see the history of this country, two major feuding ethnic groups, but they were in separate regions. There was a Tamil kingdom in the north and one or two Sinhalese kingdoms in the south. First come the Portuguese. So the Portuguese first colonized this island and they were there for about 150 years and followed by the Dutch for a further 150 years. And the, at the very end, you have the British coming. So the British come in at uh, 16, uh, no, 1796, the British come in and take over this island from the Dutch. And then they initially ruled it as two separate kingdoms. That's what the Portuguese did, that, that's what the Dutch did. They ruled this island as two separate kingdoms. The British did the same at the very beginning. But in 1833, they kind of joined it for administrative purposes. They say we'll join the two kingdoms. And they ruled it as one country for administrative purposes. When they left the country in 1948, that was when we got independence, they didn't leave it the way they found it. They left it as one joint country. So we have camels who are about 15% of the population, about 80% are uh, Sinhalese, and you have a small group of other ethnic groups. So you have an island where the majority suddenly has power because they were joined artificially into one country. Democracy only works if it is a homogeneous group. If it's a heterogeneous group where two different nations are put together, one is much larger than the other, what happens? The moment we had elections in 1948, all the power went to the Sinhalese. So overnight, the Sinhalese started disenfranchising the Tamils. One million uh, Tamils were not given citizenship. One million people were disenfranchised right after independence. Sinhalese was made the state language, the official language. And Buddhism was made the state religion. So they suddenly changed everything and they had the power to do that. The Tamils were immediately disenfranchised. What did the Tamils do? They resorted to political means to address this. And this went on for about 30 years, almost 30 years, 26 years, the Tamils tried all types of political means to address this issue. Each time they were met with violence. There were state-organized pogroms, people were being slaughtered, mass riots, killings. This happened periodically. And in the 1970s, in the 1976 onwards, you had an armed struggle. So you had the Tamils, the youth, take up weapons and start fighting the government. That's how this war started. And that war continued for about 26 years. So if you look at the timeline, so you see 1796, the British um, take over the country, 1833, I don't know whether this is clear at the back, uh, let me use a different market. 1833, they joined the country, joined the two kingdoms. For administrative purposes, and then we get independence in 1948, and soon after independence, you have all this discrimination based on ethnicity that's propagated by the majority Sinhalese, of course, who have the power. So, 1976, there is this conflict, armed conflict that starts, and that continues for many years, and the conflict ended in 2009. This movie is about the last 138 days of this conflict where people were herded, the, uh, the Liberation Tigers, the fighters as well as the civilians were herded into a narrow zone called the no-fire zone where they were slaughtered. That's what this movie is about. It's a very um, painful movie to watch. It's very disturbing. Some of the images are very disturbing. So I warn you beforehand to be prepared for that. But at the end of the movie, you will realize, um, you ask questions about this whole thing. Is this something that can be done or should be done to civilians? Now, since then, since 2009, we've had uh, 2010, there was a People's Tribunal in Dublin that called this crimes against humanity 
and war crimes. They accused the Sri Lankan government of war crimes and crimes against humanity. That's the Permanent People's Tribunal, which is based in Rome, the Permanent People's Tribunal, and the hearing was in Dublin. That was in 2010. I'm sure uh, Professor Alden can address this better. Then uh, 2013, December, they came out with another report. Now they've gone on from war crimes and crimes against humanity. Now they're calling this genocide. So 2013, December, the Permanent People's Tribunal said this is more than just war crimes and crimes against humanity. This is now genocide. At the United Nations level, it has not been considered genocide, but I just wanted to let you know that 11 justices, permanent people's tribunal, uh, you can address that more. That, uh, so that's the background to this movie. Once again, it's uh, somewhat disturbing, and um, at the very end of this, we'll try to answer questions. Okay. Thank you. Say very quickly. Um, before I'd seen the film, Professor Orlin and I had talked about me standing up here and talking to you about some of the ethical issues to pay attention to that arise in the film. After having seen the film, this seems like somewhat of a foolish thing to be doing because everything that happens in the film appears to be an egregious violation of morality. So I don't think I need to direct you intentionally to anything, but I need to say something. Here and just for theory, we can divide into what constitutes the right to go to war. But more importantly, here what we're talking about is what constitutes moral conduct within war. There's at least two things that I want to call your attention to. The first is the principle of distinction, which suggests that acts of war should only be targeted towards enemy assailants. This means that you can't intentionally target civilians, for example. Um, and you certainly can't target civilian residential areas. There's also the no means malum in say, which suggests that you can't perform acts that are evil in and of themselves. And the prototypical, prototypical example here is things like nuclear weapons. But you can also take things like rape. So rape as an act of war, as an act within war, as being evil in and of themselves, being something that's unacceptable. So these are two very simple things that I'd like to call to your attention, but over dinner, what a dinner conversation, actually. Uh, we talked about child soldiers and, and the ethics associated with giving arms to children to protect themselves against combatants who are children who have been given arms. And whether that in and of itself is ethical when you're defending yourself from child soldiers. So it's an incredibly rich film, um, and it is incredibly I don't think I'm overstating it when I say devastating film. So please do prepare yourself for it. And while you're preparing yourself for that, please also prepare your cell phones to be turned off. Um, I'll try and get the lighting here and then we can start the film. governments um, <clears throat> were concerned about intervening in this matter. They also saw the Tamils who were labeled as terrorists. Uh, the Tamil Tigers were labeled as terrorists. Uh, they, uh, the, the belief and the understanding worldwide was they invented the suicide bomber, they used the child soldiers, and, had, uh, and engaged in active terrorism. It's a very difficult position for the international community to actually intervene. Um, and what you, and, and what, why I am so careful in answering to you, it depends on the stages of where this was happening. What you saw was the last 138 days. And that's what, for me, is the most critical. Because by this point, the UN had changed its philosophy uh, after the Rwanda crisis, after Serbia in Bosnia, uh, after uh, 
many of the failures of the UN to intervene to stop ethnic cleansing and genocide, the UN began to change its position with a doctrine called responsibility to protect. That doctrine was proclaimed and understood during those last 138 days, and yet the world did not intervene. And part of the reason is geopolitics. Part of the reason is intervention legally requires a vote by the Security Council. And any one of the five permanent members of the Security Council uh, has a veto, including the People's Republic of China, uh, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, and France. Uh, certainly, uh, the interest on the part of the People's Republic, who is now aiding the Sri Lankan government with building actual bases, military bases, uh, harbors. Uh, while I was there, I saw uh, Chinese uh, workmen uh, building bridges and roads in every which direction. Uh, for China, Sri Lanka is a very important element in their geopolitical uh, agenda. As such, the Security Council is stymied, and there is very little effort that can be made by the British government, the Indian government, the American government, and others uh, have put pressure on the Sri Lankan government. But they have very little leverage because uh, the Sri Lankan government is not in any way dependent on these superpowers. India is paradoxically, because it is the power closest to Sri Lanka, may have the greatest influence in, uh, in changing the situation. And India, of course, has 70 million or more Tamils living in India. And yet India, for its own political reasons, which would require me to spend a considerable amount of time to explain to you, India has not uh, brought about, not insisted on intervention. And so it was, wasn't until last March, after this film, after the Dublin Tribunal and efforts that the UN Human Rights Council finally called for an international independent investigation, which is going on as we speak. I hope that answers your question. More complex than I would like to give you. And I don't want to take up the whole hour, but that's what it's required to explain it. If I could just add to that, uh, what Dr. Uh, Rollins said, the geopolitical position is what really uh, has been driving this. And the uh, Sri Lankan government, the present government and the Mahindra Rajapaksa, has been very clever in playing these superpowers against each other. Uh, keeping the U.S. at bay, keeping China and India. So they have gone for help to different countries, China, Pakistan, India, uh, and the U.S. at times. So they've been able to play these cards against each other. At this point, we find that they're given all the bases and uh, installations to China. And like we saw already said, 60% of the world trade, sea routes, go past Sri Lanka. So it has a very strategic location and the U.S. is also very concerned with us. So, you know, said that China is basically aiding in support? Is it, are they like complying with the weapons, considering it might be like the same as in uh, their personal interests of trade and all that? China was one of the countries that supplied weapons. Many different countries supplied weapons. Uh, including India, but China was very interested that China, uh, the string of pearls policy, if you look at what they've been doing in different parts of Asia, they've been establishing their bases, so Sri Lanka has been a strategic location in their string of pearls policy. Yeah, um, I'm uh, interested in the
Uh, that was not what was portrayed in the movie. He was actually aiding Sinhalese people. There was a Sinhalese uprising against the government in the past, against the then government, uh, the Sinhalese government, and it was called the JVP. Uh, mostly out of the universities, uh, most, it was a mostly leftist organization, and uh, thousands of people, young people, were killed by the Sinhalese. Sinhalese people were killed by the Sinhalese. He was a human rights lawyer who was trying to advocate for those people. So he was talking about the rights of the people. But when he came to power, he used the same tactics against the Tamil people. And what you must also understand that his political strength is based on Sinhalese support. So he plays the race card and the religious card very strenuously. In my last trips to Sri Lanka, uh, the one before I was uh, actually deported. As soon as you get out of the airport, there is an enormous post of greeting you, welcoming you to Sri Lanka. And there's President Rajapaksa with three Buddhist monks, and under it, it says, Sri Lanka is a Buddhist country. When you come into the airport, you can't leave the airport until you come face to face with Buddha. Buddha is sitting there in all his majesty, and you've got to walk around Buddha to get to the customs desk. And there is a big sign in front of it, please respect the image of Buddha uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, and, and as such, one clearly sees that his strength, his support, is based on uh, being uh, a Buddhist nationalist. And uh, that is, uh, no one can judge what its true motivations are, but that's certainly a truism as to why he remains in power. What has uh, uh, the Dalai Lama said about this matter? It's a very interesting point. Dalai Lama has said nothing. Uh, I have frequently, uh, in, in my discussions with the Tamil diaspora uh, and with others, why haven't you, why don't we approach the Dalai Lama uh, and speak out about this? Now, I am not an expert on Buddhism. Perhaps some of you may know more about it than I do. But I have been in the north of India, uh, where up, up near Sita, uh where the Buddhist uh, uh, refugees have come from Tibet and have been sheltered from, uh, uh, from the communists Chinese by the Indians, and where the Dalai Lama indeed has uh, his home. Um, and there, uh, you see Buddhism is very peaceful, very pacific, and they are victims of uh, the Chinese, and they are also victims of the Hindus. So it's the absolute reverse when you go down to Sri Lanka. The Buddhists there are the aggressors, and the victimizers, and the victims of the non uh, As this film portrays, and I've witnessed this firsthand, when you go to a Hindu shrine, you will see single soldiers, you will see them with guns, and they will be building contemporaneously to the Hindu shrine a Buddha and asking people, both Hindus and Buddhists, to give money for the construction of a Buddhist temple. So you see the Buddhization of the North. And to add to this, uh, I'm not an expert on Buddhism, but there are uh, two main schools of Buddhism, uh, the Theravada school and the Mahayana school. Uh, so in Sri Lanka and in Burma, you have the Theravada uh, group, and you will see in Burma too that the Buddhist monks are actively involved in uprisings, in political, in the politics of the country, and uh, I call this a virulent form of Buddhism that's being practiced in both Sri Lanka and in Burma at this point. So, not all Buddhists are of the same school. We might, uh, especially in the West, think that it's all one religion, but it's not. It has its own uh, group, it's just like you see in other religions. That's a, it's a extremely difficult lesson to learn, but one would need to understand. It's like Islam. There are differences in Islam, and there are differences in Buddhism. Um, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I'm a 
There have been hopes for charges. Uh, one of the problems is there's no jurisdiction. Uh, he has um, a diplomatic immunity. Uh, the International Court of uh, the International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction on this matter because Sri Lanka has not ratified the Treaty of Rome of 2000. Now, the only way you can bring any of these people to the International Criminal Court without a state signing the Treaty of Rome is by, the, by a Security Council vote. So in the instance of Libya, Security Council Resolution 1970 and 1973, Security Council voted that Gaddafi's family would be and could be indicted by the International Criminal Court. And they have been. So that's the President of Sudan. But that requires a vote of the Security Council. And for the reasons I expressed earlier, Security Council is not going to vote jurisdiction to bring these people to justice. What we are hoping, and it's a very faint hope, is that this report is so damning that it's now going to be brought to the Human Rights Council in Geneva that it will put pressure on the powers that be, especially the Security Council and the Secretary General, who under Article 99 can bring attention to the Security Council, those issues that he think are valuable. If the report is as damning or more damning than this and verifies this, the hope, the one remaining hope, is that the UN and popular opinion is turned around and that somewhere along the line that this will be brought to the attention of the International Court. The underlying problem, of course, is Syria. Because now that there are so many dead in Syria and so many people who have migrated, three million, two, two million people have left Syria or more, and 300,000 if not more dead, and the Security Council has not acted, there is not, at this point, a climate that would force the UN to bring this to the attention, given the fact that the Russian Federation, the People's Republic of China, do not want to see Russia Pots go to the head. that is happening, and once again, it's a big possibility. Some of the Sri Lankans hold dual citizenship and are Americans. Some hold own property in California. And the thought is that war crimes are part of, uh, are against the law in the United States under the U.S. Code. And they could be charged with war crimes here in the United States before an American court because there is universal jurisdiction for war crimes. But these people are now exceedingly careful not to set foot where they could, where the jurisdiction of the United States can be imposed by the alien court. So as you can see, this is very complex. The, the real turning point, and I don't want to stress this too much, is this film along with other activity that the world has come to a realization as to how horrific this situation has been and continues to be. That's the only thing that's going to change the world's attitude. Was the UN that made this no fire zone that all these people were supposed to happen? How many of you Was it UN that made this no fire zone? No, the UN didn't declare the no fire zone. It was declared by the Sri Lankan government and they proclaimed that they were declaring this area first profile zone number one as the protected area and then they changed it to another area. It was not by the United Nations. Was the United Nations uh, there of presence? They ordered, they ordered all United Nations personnel to leave. So everybody had to leave. They were forced to leave. Journalists were forced to leave. All non Sri Lankans, all non nationals who could record this event, was, they were forced to leave. There were some UN personnel that you saw who took it at great risk. They were taking some food convoys 
one of those convoys, Peter McKay, got trapped there. So that was how, how they protected some of these things. But the UN had no place in it. The International Red Cross tried, tried to intervene. They had no place. They were given assurances. But those assurances didn't mean it. The US government was given assurances. And to answer one of your questions, what else can change? In January, they say it's probably in January or February, there's a presidential election that's going to happen in Sri Lanka. So there is another candidate who is uh, trying to become the president. So what can change? Because it's a family-owned business right now. The president, his brother is the defense uh, secretary, then his other brother, uh, Basil, is another minister. So it's all family-owned. His children are in key positions of power. So there are many disgruntled Sinhalese and Sinhalese politicians who, try, who are trying to get rid of this regime. So if that happens, would they be willing to turn him over to the Hague? We don't know. That happened in Serbia yes. when Milosevic was turned over to the International Criminal Tribunal of Yugoslavia. You should also know that only recently, within the last few months, uh, the Net a Netherlands court held the Dutch government responsible for deserting the people in Syria, not uh, Sir, Sir Benitsa, during the Bosnian War. And so it's arguable that courts of justice can claim that the desertion uh, of the United Nations forces is in, indeed a, an act that is violating the intervention. I think one other question you posed is what can you do right now? That was the question uh, as an American. Uh, in this uh, in the university studying, I don't know what your major is, but what can you do? What's the question? Oh, you know what you can do. Well, the, the, one, it, it's very hard to press this. We do have an Amnesty International group here on campus. Uh, there is no reason why uh, the Amnesty group cannot uh, write to people in, in the American Congress. Uh, or any other place around the world. Uh, but I think it's exceedingly important that we, we get people to know of this problem. One thing is, is very interesting. Sri Lanka is a holiday rendezvous. If you, if you check your website, you will see there are wonderful vacations at very low cost to go to Sri Lanka. I advise Europeans I know and Americans I know Think twice about spending money in Sri Lanka at this point. Because if there is pressure put on the tourist industry, which is one of the largest uh, sources of income for the Sri Lankan government, it will help to change the political climate within the island. And also, at the end of the movie, you saw that you could communicate with Google that website, www.gofizone.com, I believe, or .com. Uh, you can uh, see what else you can do. And uh, uh, major corporations have uh, their manufacturing bases in Sri Lanka. There's a No to Sri Lanka campaign uh, by the Tamils in the US that's going on. Uh, some major manufacturers, some major names that you know uh, have been uh, involved in the factories. They have production in Sri Lanka. So there are ways to boycott Sri Lanka. So boycott Sri Lanka, No to Sri Lanka campaign. And people are traveling for holidays. Those are things that people can do. And screening this movie, are talking about this movie, uh, and uh, communicating with Callum McRae, who has done a wonderful job, and to get this screened in other places, that's something that you can do. Yeah, I mean, there was obviously you witnessed a systematic effort to, to hide the activities that happened there. And what's happening now is it being another systematic effort to reveal these sorts of things. What you can do is very modest, of course, but I don't know how many people knew anything about this prior to coming today. Uh, but the fact is now that you do, and you have networks that you can also make aware of. And it's modest, but it's something. Please, again. I have a question. Why You mentioned that it was like you had asked to screen. I was wondering why you were using things screened on the basis. It's, it's being screened all over the world. He is now arranging. Uh, I, I get his uh, emails, uh, his announcements. Uh, he's trying to get it on, on Netflix. Uh, he's trying to. Uh, uh, you can see his earlier versions on YouTube. They're very easy to find on YouTube. This latter version 
is only available by permission. But this one, uh, the earlier ones, are all available on YouTube, free of charge. This is the one that has been nominated for an Emmy, right? Now it has been nominated for the Emmy. I actually have a, a two-part. Uh, first is, uh, what would, I know elections are coming up. Uh, what would uh, stop him from uh, free adjusting the Constitution so he's empowered for longer? The second question is, I know in India, the, the movie uh, industry is huge with, with Bollywood. I wonder if he has that been re released in the mainstream over in India. That way we know that it is a, a major uh, political power in that region. It has not been released in Bollywood. It's not a Bollywood movie, it's a documentary. It's not been released in Bollywood. Um, there's no way of preventing him from changing the Constitution. He's already done this once. Uh, he was just for one term, he changed it, and he went for a second term. And now it's the third term. And he impeached uh, uh, the Chief Justice of the country, who was a senator, and uh, he has removed people from power, so he can change things. And uh, some people have speculated that even if he loses power uh, this election, that his brother, who is in control of the military, will stage a military coup, and they'll still retain their power. So all these things are possible. One thing you ought to know, uh, Cal McRae told us when we were in Toronto, Albania a few months ago, uh, that he was denied visas to India. So the, the, the film is not welcome to be seen in India. And you mind you, part of the problem, and it's more, it's more difficult to discuss in this context, but part of the problem is one of the largest states in India, 70 million, is Tamil Nadu. And the Indians are very concerned about the rise of, of Tamil nationalism within India. So this is not something that the Indian government looks necessarily favorable about, because it is worried about keeping the peace and keeping Tamil Nadu within the Indian Federation. Well, look, 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 this is not a court of law. This is, this is a report that will be made by the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, the Human Rights uh, uh, Council. The Human Rights Council uh, will consider that report, and the report will have recommendations. And those recommendations, we don't know what they will be yet. Hopefully, they're going to ask the Human Rights Council to suggest to the General Assembly and the Security Council that uh, this be brought before the International Criminal Court. And that's the ultimate hope. Professor Wong, you had your hand up? Oh, yes, I did, yes. Uh, uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, solutions to help the time and people, for example, international investigation and also uh, raising awareness about what is going on in uh, Sri Lanka, yeah, uh, worldwide, yeah. But I think a more imminent question uh, uh, to ask uh, uh, is how to assist, how to help these uh, Tamil people who are living under inhuman conditions. Yeah. So wh wh what do you think the international community would do in terms of uh, making sure that the Tamil people are surviving, who are facing extinction of themselves as a nation, yeah, their identity? Uh, I think that the, probably the government of Sri Lanka, uh, their goal is to have uh, those Tamil people eliminated geopolitically, maybe uh, physically. Yeah. So what do you think the international community could do? Do you think uh, that the, the, the possible solution would be partition in the case of Sudan and maybe uh, Yugoslavia? Yeah. So, yeah, that's my question. Yes, that, that's a very valid question. and. Uh, I don't have a very clear answer for this. First thing is educating the world, educating the world, making them understand that this problem exists. This war was conducted without any witnesses. Uh, there is no oil in that part of the world. Uh, people were not taking notice of this. It's not like the Middle East or other parts where people were paying a lot of attention. So people have to know that this thing happened and it's continuing, it's ongoing. And right now it's considered a genocide. 
uh, not only is it war crimes and crimes against humanity, it's a genocide. They're changing the demographics of the region. They are moving the Sinhalese population in India. The army is taking the lands of the Tamil people. All this the world should know. And that's what uh, the Tamil diaspora, the people who are spread out across the world, uh, some of them are trying to do that. That's on a smaller scale. Uh, but to let the other countries know what we are trying to do this at the United Nations, uh, what else uh, we can get here? Well, if, if, for one, I, I will suggest that there are large Tamil communities around the world. Uh, there are 300,000 Tamils in Toronto alone. 300,000 Tamils in Toronto. In England, there are how many Tamils? 100,000 Tamils. In Malaysia, there is an enormous Tamil population. In India, there are 100 million maybe Tamils. In South Africa, there are Tamils. Fiji. That's one of the Fiji. In, uh, in uh, the island, Mauritius, there are uh, large Tamil communities. One strength the Tamils have is its diaspora. And that in, in, the, in, in Canada, and I have spoken in Canada on several occasions to the Tamil community, they have elected one member of parliament who's Tamil, and now there may be two or three by this, by this election. As far as the international community is concerned, after the war, the aid came from the international community, and there was rebuilt housing, rebuilt roads. There was money that came from the international community, but it had to go through the Sri Lankan government because that is the government in power. That's the sovereign. And unfortunately, that aid has been used in a very selective, very designed manner, which accelerates the, the discrimination, if not the genocide, of the Tamil people. And so it's, it's very difficult to help the Tamils in, in the north, in Jaffna and elsewhere, because you can't, you have to go through the Sri Lankan government. And that means that the money could be diverted or used in an inappropriate way. And I have witnessed the removal of Tamil signs with the replacement of single E signs. I have witnessed uh, so much evidence of, of the colonization of single E's into the Tamil regions that one questions whether aid of one kind or another will facilitate that, precipitate that, make it worse than it actually is. And yet, I am mindful of what you said. When I witness one of the memories that will linger with me for the rest of my life is talking to a Tamil woman who is living under a plastic sheet, holding a baby without clothes, who said to me that she didn't have an aspirin and she didn't have shoes for him, and that the government would not give her aid that came from the UN, the World Food Program, because they refused, not, uh, they refused to go where they wanted it to send them, rather than go back to their own village which had been sold to Indian and to Chinese entrepreneurs who were going to build a fish farm in that village. That memory will linger with me the rest of my life. And she stood there and cried to me, what could she do? So the funds are being used for other purposes. They're so-called development. So you, you will, if you go to Japna or other the war-torn areas, the Vani area now, you'll see uh, buildings and nice highways and all these are being built but at what cost? It's being built for the government to showcase close to the highway there, is, uh, there are nice buildings but if you go into the interior of the villages people are extremely poor, they are marginalized these uh, hotels and buildings and restaurants are managed mostly by the army the soldiers are now uh, doing these kind of functions like uh, I heard uh, some people recently went there and they found that the soldiers were serving tables, they were waiting, they were running these things, and the roads are being built uh, by the Chinese government, India is having certain access to certain parts of the island, so all this is being uh, sold off so piecemeal, uh, but it's not really, the aid is not really reaching the people who are destitute. They will read them, they, 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 it's scheduled on their agenda for this fall and then in March.
to review the investigation and then to propose resolutions based on that investigation. I have met with the British Common Forum in London this summer, uh, and I know there was a meeting in New York, which I didn't attend only a few weeks ago, where the Tamil community is gathering evidence, uh, testimony, films, and the like, and providing the UN investigators with scores of evidence. The difficulty is, and I can tell you right now, having experienced in Kosovo, and that is that those who are doing the investigation neither have the time, nor the resources, nor the ability. Who amongst them and the investigators is fluent in Tamil? Who amongst them has the time to read thousands and thousands of sheets of affidavits or to see all these films? That's why this film is so valuable, because it condenses it in 90 minutes. It's not. It is and it isn't. It's carefully being provided. It's a, it's a trickle. And, and those who are the aid donors are trying to ensure that what they give is being used for the right purposes. And so that slows the aid, and, well, except for those aid from the Chinese government or elsewhere, or friendly governments, who are pouring money in. So, I'm curious, I, I know this is more philosophical than practical, certainly none of us would agree with what the government has done there, but as Professor Orlin mentioned, there was really terrorist activity, it seems, going on on behalf of the rebels. How do we deal philosophically and internationally with situations that escalate like this, where you look at it and like, it's hard to say that there's a side that's right and a side that's wrong. No, you see atrocities on both sides. And how do you adjudicate something like this? And philosophically, how do we deal with this as an international community? Let, let me uh, say that, say a few words, and then let Professor all and then Professor Rido answer that. Now, if you look at this word terrorism, uh, when was it coined, and where has it been used, and is there a definition of terrorism. This is what we need to think about first. So the first time this word terrorism uh, is in use is in the uh, uh, Reign of Terror, uh, 1795 or somewhere there in France, Reign of Terror, during that time. Later on it's being used even in the context of Israel. Uh, so they were using this word terrorist. And if you look at uh, a former premier who later won uh, the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Menachem Begin, he was called a terrorist. So this word terrorism in different contexts means different things. And there is no universally acceptable, comprehensive definition of terrorism. And after 2008, uh, 2001, uh, this con concept of war on terror uh, sort of painted everybody with broad brush strokes and called everybody a terrorist. So you find that some people, one person's freedom fighter happens to be another person's terrorist. And also terror tactics, if practiced by certain groups, if it is, let's say, the mafia who practice terror tactics to keep their people together, their members together, or gangs that practice this to keep their members together. That's not considered terrorism in the modern concept. We don't call the terrorists. We call anything that's politically motivated uh, as terrorism. And if it is targeting civilians, somebody would say, if it's primarily targeting civilians, we should call it ter terrorism. Some people state that only if it is non-state actors practicing this kind of tactic, it's considered terrorist. While others who are non-state actors would say, this is a poor man's weapon, or this is in a David and Goliath struggle, uh, a terrorist tactic is the only one that a uh, small group or David can use against a large power. So you also know that states use the word terrorism to delegitimize <coughs> any political opposition. If it involves violence, they're going to use the word terrorist or terrorism to delegitimize these people, paint them with this picture. So that's my take on this terrorism. Not to say that there were no violations. I'm not arguing for or against that. I, he was very clear, Callum McCree was very unbiased and very clear to state that there were uh, activities by the LTT that uh, targeted civilians. He didn't 
cover that up or uh, whitewash that. He was very clear about that. So they have activity. But that's a non-state actor. The state, which claims that all these people are its citizens, is practicing something, destroying all these citizens. <coughs> that is definitely terrorism, a state terrorism. And that's my take on this, and I would let the other two answer. I, I, I'm going to let Chris respond to the philosophical question, but I'll, I'll, let me just say to you that I am, that there is, we have made a terrible error in saying there's a war on terrorism. Terrorism is a strategy. Terrorism is a mechanism. Terrorism is not a crime. Crimes against humanity, genocide, those are crimes. They have crimes that have material elements, crimes you can look to and point to and say you are a criminal. As far as I'm concerned, from day one, and I was in the minority and probably still am, those who attacked the World Trade Center may have used terrorism, but they weren't terrorists. They were international pirates. They pirated a plane and used it uh, illegally. And the, definite, the crime they committed under international law was crimes against humanity and piracy, mass murder. They did not commit a crime called terrorism. <coughs> and when our government calls it a war on terrorism, you don't declare war on a strategy. You declare war on those who use the strategy. So if you're going to declare a war, you declare it on a state, or you declare it on a non-state actor. But you don't declare it on a strategy. And what we have done is confused public thinking to thinking that there is something called a terrorist. Yes, there is terrorism, it's a strategy. But the terrorist is a criminal because he has committed mass murder, he's committed hijacking, he's committed piracy, he's committed genocide, he has committed one of the crimes that you find in the international litany of crimes. And so, in, in, in my sense, yes, there were international crimes on the part of the Tigers, and there were international crimes on the part of the Sinhalese government. And so, as a lawyer and as a human rights activist, bring all the criminals to justice. And uh, Secretary, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said, uh, in reference to the Tigers at the time, she said, we should not be painting everybody with those broad brushstrokes. So, and to add to uh, what I said before, uh, Menachem Begin uh, was one of the people who was named as uh, the one who masterminded or was part of the bombing of the King David Hotel, uh, which killed civilians. Uh, it was a very long time ago. Later on, he became uh, the prime minister, and then he got the Nobel Peace Prize. So, so the same thing happened with Mandela. Nelson Mandela was uh, called a terrorist uh, for a long time. So. This word terrorist really doesn't have And a so was Patrick Henry, and so was uh, uh, many of our founders who we So we really don't have a good definition for terrorism. That's my... I suppose, I mean, my response is, let's assume that the acts of the, the terrible and unjust have happened to Mount I mean, let's assume that this is the case, and the question emerges, what is the appropriate response from the Sri Lankan government? And just work theory is, is very clear on this. Principles of proportionality, right? Uh, moral action within war only involves you acting in a proportional sort of way. That doesn't mean that you can act proportionately in terms of performing acts that are evil in and of themselves, right? So this is, uh, uh, of course, the case. There's also this principle of distinction which suggests that you cannot intentionally target civilian populations. You cannot. Uh, so if, if the assumption is that there was a serious threat to the Sri Lankan government. It's unclear how attacks on civilians address that threat. Overt attacks on hospitals address that threat. So we don't even have to question the what constitutes terrorism. We can, we can assume that it was as, as bad as you want to assume, and, and the actions still seem. Can uh, Chris? Can I turn the tables around and ask you how how do you feel? seeing this movie. What did it do to you, if anything? I'm curious as to why I was born in
let me just put it in, in the context of time. What was happening was, uh, one, 2001 had happened, and this so-called war on terror, or war on terrorism, that was ongoing. So everybody was, was being labeled as terrorists. The LTT was labeled as a terrorist organization in many countries in the world. Including the United States. Including the United States. And that quickly escalated to that point. And then there was this peace accord. There was a peace accord. The LTT had fought this battle to a stalemate. And there was a peace accord, accord uh, brokered by the Norwegians. And there was a peace accord signed in 2002. And the, the, land, the territory that the Tigers held they were allowed to hold, then they had the courts, the judiciary system, the police force, uh, they were taxing the people, you heard about that. So they had their, uh, they were forward defense lines, FDLs for both the Sri Lankan government and the uh, Tigers. Uh, the suicide bombings had ceased, but the Sri Lankan government timed it in such a way to restart the war so that it coincided with certain key uh, uh, timelines. What happened was they escalated the war so much towards the end of 2008. What was happening in 2008? There was a presidential election going on in the U.S. So there was a presidential election. November, uh, President Obama was elected. But still the key elements were functioning under the, uh, the previous government, under Bush's administration. It was still functioning like that. Uh, he took office in February. Uh, in, uh, on the 20th of February, uh, 2009, uh, both my, my wife and I organized a big protest in front of the White House. We brought in people from Canada, Tamils came from all over. We had 10,000 people in front of the White House. And we continued to have protests, but nothing much could be done because it was a time when things were changing. So the Sri Lankan government planned in such a way they finished everything so quickly. Within that three month period, they had slaughtered between 70 to 140,000 people along with the fighters. They, didn't care how many civilians they killed. They, they did this major uh, slaughter during that time. So they, they had this timeline nicely uh, planned out. So that was one of the, that's one aspect I can give you why nobody was focusing on this. Yes. Very well planned. Um, the guy in we just said about how they planned it right, why didn't like other countries besides like and the US is a big superpower, but like, you know, the China I know the Chinese and Asian book. Great Britain or Russia or you know, any of the UN countries trying to set that. I know you guys talked about uh, the geographical location how trade goes in China and Australia, I think it's kind of sets to you a little bit. Isn't life more important than you know, ethnic? No. All the things that they're doing ethnically there more important than a trade group, kind of? Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but but in reality is that what happens? In reality, when we talk about it, if there is no oil, people don't focus there. That's the reality. And let, let, me, let me suggest further. Part of the problem is none of the great world powers, except for India and for China, had any leverage with the China. In other words, if, if the United States or Britain, who was the former colonial uh, uh, sovereign, uh, uh, had no way you say, we want to do this, or this will happen. There was no leverage. The only le and the Chinese created their own leverage and helped themselves. I'd like to maybe follow up on that idea. I, I, I imagine each of you has an interesting perspective um, raised by your idea of protesting outside the White House, right? Absent action from the UN. We've seen the U.S. sort of stand up unilaterally in several different situations in Eastern Europe and the Middle East. Absent action from the U.N. or the international community, would it be right or appropriate or justified for the U.S.? You say there's nothing you can do. The U.S. has a history of putting bombs or boots on the I, I, I get the gist of your question. That happened in Kosovo when the U.N. was stalemated because uh, the Russian Federation wouldn't support any action against Yugoslavia, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, the Clinton administration, went forward and NATO uh, invoked the treaty and did it. That was held to be contrary to the UN Charter. Kofi Annan, the latest to, to be Secretary General, had said this was illegal but legitimate. 
meaning and that created the R2P doctrine that, and changed the UN's perception of it. Because Kofi Annan Indian said the charter has to be read now so that we can act as we couldn't act uh, under the, the Kosovo situation, thereby not necessitating the ultra virus illegal act of the United States by a NATO. So that's why we introduced that new doctrine. That new doctrine worked very successfully in Libya when there was consensus amongst the five and the Arab League and the African Union who called for the ouster of Gaddafi. And NATO, therefore, at the request of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the United Nations, intervened in Libya. The same thing happened in Cote d'Ivoire, that is the Ivory Coast, where the French were able to, to get consensus to bring about change in the Ivory Coast, and they used French groups uh, on the basis of UN support. What has happened is, because of the success and or failure of Libya, the Russians and the Chinese have become anti-R2P and say that R2P is nothing but a subterfuge for regime change. And so they refuse to use R2P in Syria. And that's why the Syrian event is going on. So the, the answer is yes, it is feasible that given our past experience, without Security Council there can be intervention. But the constellation, the stars have to be in the right constellation for that to happen. It didn't happen in Sri Lanka, and of course the other great tragedy, which may be just as great if not greater of the tragedy, Syria, continues to go on because the stars are not in the right constellation. I don't know if that answers the question. And uh, that goes towards what I was uh, suggesting earlier on, that timeline. U.S. could have done something, but the timeline was so planned, so very well planned, that the U.S. was in this transitional phase from one president where he elected in November, takes office in February, and nothing gets really started at that point. Everything is finished in a short time. So. I, I guess what, what I'm curious about, I'm sorry, Alan, is would you have liked to have seen that? Would you have liked to have seen that? Would you have liked to have seen that? Supposing the U.S. could have unilaterally intervened, would you have seen that as desirable? Yes, that is what we were asking for, that is what we were pleading for. We were meeting with senators and congressmen, and this is what we were asking. Um, and even after uh, the president had uh, said, uh, we, uh, I want the gun silenced, and uh, uh, they did. The Tigers had, at that point had silenced their weapons, and uh, there was an interview, and I remember my wife saying, uh, this is like the child standing on a uh, uh, cliff, and you say jump, and the child jumps, and you don't do anything. You don't uh, catch this child. So that's, that's what really happened there. Like, even after everything was stopped, like, it was devastating. A, a story is told, if, if, if I can regress for a moment, that at the opening of the Holocaust Museum, Bill Clinton was there to cut the ribbon. And Ilya Wiesel, the Nobel Peace Prize winner who had written Night, who was a survivor of uh, the Holocaust and the camps, uh, had heard Clinton's speech because, of course, he's the founder of the Holocaust Museum. He was the inspiration behind the Holocaust Museum. And of course, Clinton made the speech, never again, we will never have a Holocaust again. Afterwards, the story is told that Ellie Bivazell pulled Clinton aside and said, what do you mean, never again? Under your watch, Rwanda happened and Serbanica happened. And now the people in Kosovo are dying. The Albanians are dying. And it is said that that little episode changed the Clinton administration's policy. Now, I, if you ask me the question, I would have liked Ban Ki-moon or Kofi Annan or whatever Secretary of General say, oh, this was illegal but legitimate. Because if we could have saved those hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives, well, then we could go back and say, let's change the UN so that it responds more appropriately to humanitarian crisis of this dimension. Uh, Sorry for my passion. I've heard many times you said about uh, oil and there is no, it doesn't draw attention about Sri Lanka. So in a, in a way, if there was oil in Sri Lanka, like America would be there in no time. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't say that, but I was, just, I was being somewhat 
facetious, I think, uh, when I said uh, there's not too much interest in that region, we're not focusing on that region. Uh, it, uh, other than this geopolitical thing that we're talking about, there isn't much that the West focuses on that particular region. Only now looking at China's plans and how they have been slowly working their way towards getting this base, that the Western countries are very concerned. But it has not been an area where we have been focused on for a very, very long time, not recently, not for the last 50 years, we've not been focused on this area. So oil was just an way of uh, putting it there, putting, getting people to focus on it. Yeah. If there was oil, people would put it. They might not have gone there if there was no oil. But I, I will tell you that the problems in the South China Seas may create more interest in Sri Lanka because the U.S. Navy has bases in the Indian Ocean. And if the South China Sea heats up, as it is already between Vietnam and China, uh, what happens in Sri Lanka may be of more strategic importance. I would argue with you that there is a level of complicity. It depends on if they knew, if they understood that their assistance and their aid was indeed supportive of their policies, then I would argue that there's a level of complicity. A country who uh, helps another country to uh, complete genocide is also guilty of genocide. It's called complicity for genocide. And so when the Bulgarians allowed for the trains to bring the, the uh, Greek Jews from Thessaloniki through Bulgaria into Auschwitz, the Bulgarians were clearly complicit with the Germans for genocide. So that, I hope that answers your question. And uh, the, I was referring to the Permanent People's Tribunal. They had the first uh, report in 2010. The latest one came out in December of 2013. We are now they're calling this genocide. In that they have named two countries. They have said both the United Na uh, UK, United Kingdom, and the U.S. are complicit in this. They have actually named the two countries. And I, you know, and the, this wiki. This is the last version of it. This one had the wiki stuff in it. And so it was a much better view of what has happened because of the wiki news. My guess is, as time goes along, we will know more as to who was complicit and who wasn't. I can well imagine that in the early stages of the Rajapaksa's regime against this, I, 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 I don't have any evidence of this, but it, it's plausible that uh, American CIA, American uh, NSA, and British uh, forces and others uh, were supportive of the effort to uh, diminish the power of the tunnels, whether they did it with the design of the genocidal intent of the Rajapaksa regime, I don't think we can go that far. Right, right. But if we can say that, by all means, there was support for the end of terrorism. And in that sense, I think the Rajapaksa regime thought they had a green light. The LTT had been labeled a terrorist officer in the US, and there was this war on terrorism, so. So propaganda and wrong intention. Well, you have a right intention for the Last question, maybe. I just want to draw attention to uh, the peace treaty that they talked about at the beginning of the movie. Um, do you think that uh, Sri Lanka used that peace treaty because they actually wanted peace, or that it was a cowardly act to kind of get the upper hand and catch them off guard? Much like uh, the and the, the, the Are you referring to the 2002 peace accord right. brokered by the Norwegians? Well, no, no, in Sri Lanka. Yes, in Sri yeah. Lanka. This was the peace accord between the LTT and the Sri Lankan government that was brokered by the Norwegian government, and the peace accord was signed in 2002. Uh, that's when the LTT stopped their suicide bombings and also. Uh, I would say that uh, both parties would have been skeptical about this lasting for too long. Um, I don't know what the motives, are, motives were with the Sri Lankan government or the LTT, what they were planning on doing. But uh, there was peace for a short time, where the people were building up their forces. The Sri Lankan government definitely broke that ceasefire agreement and attacked. 
So they must have been planning something. And the time frame was uh, very critical, the way they attacked. Okay, this is the last This is the last, yeah. <laughs> so the question is actually in person, how optimistic you are? Because when I was watching the movie, I was thinking about the play when I did my research in Tajikistan, which is, was also attacked by a civil war, very cr cruel civil war. And it ended by a reconciliation process, which was like, governed by United Nations. And probably in political science textbook, you can read that it was an like, ideal reconciliation process. Where was it again? I didn't hear it. What was the Tajikistan. Tajikistan. Okay. So, um, so, uh, and then the people were left alone. Actually, they have a dictatorship. Uh, they got rid of the opposition, and so, so you know, like the situation is is actually terrible. But uh, so, how optimistic you are about the situation here? Because we can sit, sit here, we can speak about Geneva's conventions, we can speak about all those stuff, but I'm asking about the reality, about resolving situations, bringing justice. Because I have some level of optimism is why I'm doing what I'm doing. We're trying to get the world to understand and to stand up for the right thing. So I am optimistic that uh, justice will prevail. That uh, the, I, I am optimistic that the majority of the Sinhalese people, uh, for the majority on the island, do not support this kind of an action. This was the government, uh, a, a dictatorial government run by a family, that conducted this genocidal war. And uh, now you see at the end of the uh, movie, towards the end, you see that he's now, this family is now attacking the Sinhalese. The chief justice was a Sinhalese. The, Journalists are being killed, Sinhalese journalists are being killed. So now, uh, if you keep silent, just like uh, Nemo's uh, poem, like you keep silent, eventually it comes back to uh, bite you. So that's what's happening to the Sinhalese. So uh, I'm optimistic that the majority of uh, Sinhalese will realize that this is a great wrong and somehow has to be rectified. So I am optimistic that if the regime changes, these people will be brought to trial. I am optimistic about it. Yeah, but let, me, let, let me just add a, a, a few words. I, I don't know enough about Sri Lankan internal politics to say this with uh, any real conviction. But when you when we visit the island, it's paradise. It, it's, the climate is wonderful. The soil is extraordinary. The crops are beyond belief. The foods, the, the, the mountains, the tea, the rivers, the water, it is, it is truly, if, if you had to make a movie of Shangri-La, go to Sri Lanka. It is that kind of a, a country. It's an extraordinary place. And it's an island of 20 odd million people. So ultimately, one would hope that one realizes that you are on this island. And there is, you, that's, you're going to have to live together on the island. I ask the Tamils all the time, and in certain Tamil circles, I'm not very popular, because I ask some hard questions of the Tamils. I say, you want an independent Tamil nation? What do you see the island look like? Do you want it to be Cyprus? Where six, for 60 years, the country, the country is divided by UN peacekeepers, and where your entire budget is spent protecting your sovereignty? And where your cousin who lives in Colombo cannot visit you in Jaffna? Where you can't do business in the South? What kind of island do you ultimately want? Now, I understand perfectly, and I'm very much aware, that this minority has been uh, absolutely uh, destroyed. Whether it's genocide or not, that's a legal word. But it's certainly a prima facie case of genocide. And so it's very hard when you do have a genocide or mass killing or grave violations of human rights for people to live successfully with one another. But let me suggest to you, as you say, Tajikistan, there are other places in the world, Rwanda, Uganda, there are loads of places in the world, East Timor, where there have been these terrible situations and certainly South Africa, where there have been efforts, where there has been lustration, 
a cleansing uh, from of criminality and a, a realization of the wrongs of the past and looking to the forward. And so I'm neither optimistic or pessimistic. I'm hopeful. Hopeful that reason and rationality will win out over hatred and bitterness and the need for retribution. And a realization that this island can truly be a paradise if, if the two peoples can respect one another, each other's dignity, the human rights that they have both proclaimed they believe in. That until that happens, there is no opportunity for any true peace. And Peace without dignity is not peace. And if I were to add to that, uh, I agree with what you're saying. On the other hand, I have to point out that there were two separate kingdoms, and that's how this island was for centuries, many, many, many centuries. When the Portuguese came two separate islands, it has been like two separate kingdoms. Uh, so it has been governed as two separate kingdoms, it, even though it's an island. It did exist as two separate kingdoms, not for 10 years, not for 100 years, for a very long time. Is it possible to go back to the same situation again? I'm not saying, or I'm not saying it's going to work that way. I'm not saying I'm optimistic that there will be a separate country. I'm optimistic that there will be some peace and dignity, and that the majority of Sinhalese would understand that they have to live with the capitals. And if you look, and there are examples like Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia is split. And they remain at peace, and, they, and there is a need to, both are members of the European Union, and both have found a way to have their identity recognized in separate nations, but without the kind of animus that exists in Cyprus. So when I ask Tomles, what kind of island do you want? Do you want Cyprus, or do you want the Czech and Slovak Republic? Oh, I don't think that there is a way back to the Czechoslovakia situation in that way. Yeah. Exactly, and, and the Slovaks are happy the way they are, and the, and the Czechs are, but, they, but they're not angry at each other and, and ready to go to war with one. Please join me in thanking. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. And I also want to say, uh, uh, I've now seen the film several times, and I've watched the audience in Toronto, Albania, only very recently. Uh, and uh, just as here, uh, virtually no one walked out of that theater for 90 minutes. People were riveted to that screen. Uh, and uh, it is a very difficult movie to watch. Uh, I'm, I'm unfortunately, you, the, some of the things you saw may linger with you tonight, and may linger with you with days ahead. All I can ask is, put it in. I'll ask my psychiatrist friend, put it in a right perspective, understand that this is a tragedy, but make sure that it doesn't impact you emotionally in a, in a negative way that uh, could be injurious to you or your loved ones. A very good point indeed. I should have addressed this like you said. I, I did show it to my staff, my psychologists, uh, my therapists and counselors, and some of them were disturbed by this, and they did come and talk to me afterwards a couple of days later. But they all, even the ones who were somewhat disturbed by this, felt that they were they, they were happy that I had screened it. They were happy that they had seen it. I, I screened not this version, but the previous version. Um, and uh, they didn't have any lasting effects. As far as I know, they would have come to me. But uh, do take uh, this seriously, that uh, you might have some issues in the next couple of days. You might think about it. But uh, be open about it, talk to your friends. But thank you very much uh, for, you, you have been very attentive, you have stayed through this whole presentation and this long, long movie and you, were, you had asked you questions. Thank you so much.